Welcome to the first of four course modules addressing measurement and rehabilitation practice. This course was funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research through the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Improving Measurement of Medical Rehabilitation Outcomes, which is awarded to the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. My name is Alan Heineman, Project Director of the RRTC on Outcomes. The course objectives are to recognize the value and importance of using classification schemes and outcome measures to evaluate body function and body structure, activity and participation, and environmental factors that influence participation. Second, to evaluate, interpret, and document client goals and outcomes in clinical practice using a client-centered approach. Third, increase one's capacity to effectively utilize resources to assist with outcome measurement selection, including the use of online databases to find assessment tools and interpret their measurement properties. The next four objectives are listed here. They are to crit critically evaluate measurement properties of existing outcome measures for application to clinical practice, including validity, reliability, responsiveness, and clinical utility. Next, identify strategies to facilitate the use of outcome measurements in clinical practice. Sixth, identify strategies to overcome common barriers to implementing outcome measurement in clinical practice. And seven, sustain outcome measurement use across one's practice and across practice sites or program. The course is organized into four modules. The first module provides an introduction to the course and addresses the first objectives. Subsequent modules build on the first module and address the other six objectives. The primary audience for the courses are professional occupational and physical therapy students in their entry-level training. Secondary audiences are students and trainees in allied health, medical, nursing, and other disciplines. The content will require modification for these secondary audiences. Well, let's get started with an introduction to this first module. We'll cover four major topics, definitions, benefits of measurement, barriers to measurement, and outcomes classification system. So what is an outcome? And what is an outcome measure? Outcome measures are intended to track change in a patient's status. Outcome measures psychometric properties have been studied in patient populations and are reported in the peer-reviewed literature, providing clinicians with evidence to support their use in practice. The literature contains a variety of definitions which emphasize different aspects of these core themes. The bottom line, outcomes reflect the influence of person characteristics such as severity of impairment, life roles and cultural experience, processes of care, and external factors in the environment. There are a variety of reasons why patient characteristics should be measured using standard outcome measures. Uh, it helps with documentation in electronic records. It facilitates use in clinical information systems. It supports development of clinical knowledge and supports professional education and allows resource allocation and accountability in patient care. Patient care is a very important arena in which outcome measures are used. It helps us establish a patient's baseline status, to track a patient's progress, to determine the effectiveness of the plan of care, it helps inform patients of their progress in a quantifiable manner. It helps inform payers of patient progress uh, to enhance reimbursement and provides uh, data collected over time when in aggregate form to improve care. There are multiple benefits of outcome measurement that uh, benefit specific stakeholders. Health professionals providing patient services, referral sources that desire information on patient improvement, patients and their loved ones, payers of rehabilitation services, both governmental and private, and scientists. Some of the individual and organizational benefits are listed here, organized by both individual and group or organizational benefits. So for health professionals, uh, benefits include supported clinical decisions and competence with one's colleagues and referral sources, improved communication. Communication engagement can be enhanced with patients, with insurers and payers, uh, it facilitates communication around claim decisions, and for scientists, it helps evaluate clinical trial benefits. At the group or organizational level, accountability, efficiency, effectiveness, value, and effectiveness uh, in communicating with scientists is facilitated. There are factors that can facilitate routine use of outcome measures. 
For individual practitioners, facilitators can be a positive appraisal of outcome measurement, the opportunity to modulate services flexibly, the availability of evidence to negotiate with insurers regarding coverage of services, and the opportunity to use outcome measures for quality improvement. Finally, a desire to deliver therapy consistently across similar patients uh, can facilitate outcome measurement. There are a variety of external facilitators that can uh, support outcome measurement use as well, including organizations that evaluate outcome measures, opinion leaders in the field, resources such as websites that provide guidance on instrument selection, administration, scoring, and interpretation. However, there are also barriers to outcome measurement at both the individual and organizational level. At the individual level, practitioners may lack time, knowledge, resources, or competence to select measures. They may also hold negative attitudes regarding outcome measures, believing they're unnecessary to assure high quality services um, when administered consistently. They may believe they just know what works. Organizations can also impose barriers on outcome measurement use. These barriers result from cost concerns, absence of or limited compliance with policy, a culture that doesn't promote outcome monitoring, and an absence of internal consensus on what to measure. Well, moving to the next theme of this presentation, outcomes classification systems that can support our understanding of outcome measures. There are a variety of ways to classify patient outcomes. Many of them have been developed to reflect the needs of specific disciplines. The most widely used system is the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health, and it's this classification that we'll focus on in this module. The ICF distinguishes three broad categories of human performance, the body function and structure level, activities and participation, and environmental factors. There's an online browser that provides greater detail about the ICF. The URL is located on the bottom of this slide. Perhaps we can use this graph to illustrate the complex nature of health and how the various levels of the ICF can relate to one another. To link it to outcome measurement, we can state that an outcome measure results uh, at one level can help us understand the broader impact on the person or why she or he may be having problems at another level. For example, an impairment of cognition at the body function level detected by a poor score on the mini mental status examination or similar test can indicate that a patient may not be able to carry out daily activities such as managing a household and paying bills, an activity limitation, thus is unable to live independently, a participation restriction. The extent to which environmental factors these can include a variety of factors, including uh, architectural limitations and social attitudes, uh, can also limit activity and participation, as may personal factors, characteristics intrinsic to the individual. Listed on this slide are the body functions and structures within the ICF. The eight chapters correspond to major body systems um, and are organized similarly across the body functions and body structures arena. So for example, chapter one of the body functions focuses on mental functions and correspondingly in body structures, chapter one focuses on structures of the nervous system. Activities and participation in the ICF are listed here. Chapter one addresses learning and applying knowledge, Chapter 2, General Tasks and Demands. Chapter 3, Communication. Chapter 4, Mobility. Chapter 5, Self-Care. Chapter 6, Domestic Life. Chapter 7, Interpersonal Interactions and Relationships. Chapter 8, Major Life Areas. And Chapter 9, Community, Social, and Civic Life, which have to do with participation typically outside of one's home in the community. Environmental factors are listed here. The five chapters address products and technology, the natural environment and human-made changes to it, support and relationships, attitudes of other persons, and services, systems, and policies. A variety of outcome measures exist across the ICF. This enables healthcare professionals to quantify the various ways a health condition can affect an individual 
and ensures a comprehensive approach to patient care. For example, at the body function and structure level, the mini mental status examination provides a screening tool for cognition. At the activity level, the functional independence measure is used in inpatient rehabilitation facilities to measure a variety of functional tasks and capabilities. Finally, the community integration questionnaire is a self-report measure of role function and community interaction that measures or operationalizes aspects of participation. Well, let's review the topics covered today. You should be able to answer what is an outcome measure, why it's important to measure patient characteristics using standardized outcome instruments, the benefits of outcome measurement using standardized instruments, barriers to outcome measurement, facilitators to outcome measurement, and a classification system that helps guide thinking about outcomes. I'd like to acknowledge the staff who have been involved in developing these education modules. Joy Hamill at the University of Illinois, Carolyn Baum at Washington University, Jennifer Moore at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, Jennifer Pyatt at Indiana University, Kirsten Potter at Rockhurst University, and Jill Bateman, formerly of the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Other project contributors include Ann Deitch at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and Northwestern University, Richard Gershon, Medical Social Sciences at Northwestern University, Alan Kozlowski, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Jason Rad, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, and Kathleen Stevens at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. We provide several references that help you delve more deeply into the topics addressed today, listed on this slide, and on this slide. While this module is copyrighted, it's licensed under a Creative Commons license, URL listed here. You're free to copy, distribute, and transmit the work subject to the conditions of the license. If you want permission to modify the work or use it for commercial purposes, please contact me at the email address listed here.